Um, I know we've dragged you too much this period and uh, you've been so gracious to answer. Also. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. It's a pleasure, Gechi. Thank you. We're so grateful. Okay, thank you, everyone. And uh, we are live. We are almost out of time to change our nation. Inflation upsets our welfare. Insecurity threatens our safety. Political apathy impacts our freedom. Digital exclusion limits our potential. We all deserve a secure future. If not now, when? Participate at the 27th Nigerian Economic Summit. Theme, securing our future. The fierce urgency of now. Date, the 25th to the 26th of October, 2021. Register on www.nsgroup.org forward slash 27. Okay, so it's um, 11.02 and we start. Good morning, everyone, and um, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today for this um, pre-27 Nigerian Economic Summit virtual event. My name is Ogechi Obira, and I am the facilitator of the Gender Community of Practice of the NESG. Today, we'll be engaging panelists on uh, gender equality and inclusion strategies for economic development. And uh, this is uh, one of the many pre-summit conversations for next 27, uh, that we convene stakeholders from both the public, the private, the development and the non-governmental sectors to critically examine and address um, policy issues, strategies, best practices on gender and inclusion across all sectors, um, across the public and private sectors as well. Um, so the speakers are going to be speaking to us um, about their experiences, about their perspectives, and they will focus on um, strategic policies and practices of gender equality and inclusion at all levels, and both at the private and the public and the and informal sector. And um, they will also be speaking about interventions in bridging the gender gap and fostering um, gender parity in Nigeria. And the 27th Nigerian Economic Summit with the theme, Securing Our Future, the Fierce Urgency of Now, is scheduled to hold on the 25th and the 26th of October, 2021. Um, it's a hybrid event and the physical event will be taking place in Abuja. Please, if you haven't registered for the conference, please kindly go to the website, um, nesgroup.org 27 to register and obtain your tickets 
for the event. Like I said earlier, it's a hybrid event with both physical and uh, virtual participation. And we look forward to having you at the summit. And so just before we start a little bit of housekeeping, um, participants are please encouraged to turn off their microphones for us to have a very seamless conversation. And if you have any questions during the panel discussions, please type them in the question box um, on the either the Zoom or the YouTube control panel for those who are joining us on YouTube. And uh, we will bring them up during the Q&A at the end of the panel discussions. So thank you very much once again um, to our distinguished um, participants, as well as our distinguished panelists. And I would just go on to introduce the, our moderator for today's event, um, Mrs. Um, Funke Barowa. So Mrs. Funke Barowa is a gender and a development practitioner with over two decades of experience for both the government and the civil society, focusing on public policy, gender advocacy, civil society, strengthening and governance. She has led several social policies and reforms in Nigeria and served at various times as CEO of uh, the Nigerian Women Trust Fund, a technical and financial resource for women in governance in Nigeria. She was once the program officer at the DePong Petroleum Special Trust Fund and the National Poverty Eradication Program. She's a gender advisor at the Office of the Spe Senior Special Assistant to the President on MDGs and a technical assistant research policy and planning in the Ministry of Communication and Technology. Uh, Mrs. Barawa is currently the Regional Program Officer for Gender and Racial and Ethnic Justice at the Ford Foundation Office for West Africa, where she leads work on ending violence against women and girls. She holds a BSc and an MBA in management from the Universities of Abuja. And um, she also has PG certifications in gender and public policy and management from the Universities of East Anglia and York, UK. Uh, and also she's, uh, in, despite her busy schedule, she's currently pursuing an MA in Corruption and Governance at the University of Sussex. Um, Mrs. Barawa has graciously um, accepted to moderate the session with you, and I promise you that um, it would be very enlightening. So I leave you into the very good hands of Mrs. Barawa. Thank you. Over to you, Mr. Barawa. Good morning, panelists. Good morning, uh, the team and crew at NESG. And good morning to uh, participants. Thank you very much for joining us uh, on this panel, Agenda Equality and Inclusion Strategies for Economic Development. Uh, we're really looking forward to a great conversation here with you all. Once again, I want to thank you for, uh, for joining us. I would like to call, can you please show the agenda, thank you. I would like to call on Mrs. Bonu Adetayo, hello. Yeah, good morning, and uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ogechi, for uh, a good start, and thank you so much, uh, our moderator. I have no doubt in my mind that today will be uh, an exceedingly uh, fruitful uh, event. Uh, Your Excellency, Mrs. Aisha Halilu Buhari, the First Lady of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, uh, who I am told is unavoidably absent this morning, but hopefully to be represented. Uh, distinguished heads of ministries, departments and agencies, captains of industry, industries, heads of associations, donor communities, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. It is with great pleasure that I welcome you to this NEST 27 pre-summit event with the theme, gender equality and inclusion strategies for economic development. 
Today's webinar is one of the pre-summit events of the 27th Nigerian Economic Summit, jointly organized by the Nigerian Economic Summit Group and the Federal Ministry of Finance, Budget, and National Planning. Our pre-summit events are geared towards engaging stakeholders in a series of conversations in the weeks leading to the 27th Nigerian Economic Summit. And as you very well know, it is scheduled to hold as a hybrid event in October 25 and also 26 uh, this very year. And um, as Ogechi invited you, in case you have not registered, I urge you to go to nesgroup.org slash 27 so that you can pre-register yourself now. The conversations and outcomes of these pre-summit events will serve as valuable inputs into the summit deliberations at the forthcoming NEST 27. Public and private sector stakeholders will explore and conceptualize methods and approaches that Nigeria can adopt to reverse the poor economic trends, improve the human capital base of the economy, mitigate security challenges, and lay the necessary foundation that will leapfrog Nigeria into a future of high, sustained, and inclusive economic growth. According to Kofi Annan, gender equality is more than a goal in itself. It is a precondition for meeting the challenges of reducing poverty, promoting sustainable development, and building good governance. Going by this statement, our nation cannot successfully tackle issues of poverty reduction and the promotion of sustainable development without addressing the issues of gender inequality. It is sad to note that the holistic growth, development and transformation of women and girls continue to suffer serious impediments from institutional, religious and cultural nuances. This inequality has created a huge gender gap between men, women, and even girls in all aspects of life. The post-COVID-19 pandemic has further amplified these pre-existing gender gaps and raised new barriers to building inclusive economies and societies. With the added pressures of providing care in the home, the crisis has arrested progress toward gender parity in several economies and industries. According to the World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report of 2021, another generation of women will have to wait for gender parity. With the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, closing the global gender gap has increased by a generation from 99.5 years to 135.6 years. It means that you and I are not likely to be here when that gender gap gets closed. It is even more disappointing to note that the Global Gender Gap Index Report 2021 ranks Nigeria 139 position out of 156 countries, having lost 11 places in year 2020. This means that our country is worse than 88% of the countries on Gender Gap Index. For me, this should be a very, very serious concern and an urgent call for attention. There's a clear consensus that no economy can grow to its full potential if its women remain unequal to men. The IMF estimates that Nigeria's GDP could increase by as much as $229 billion by 2025 if gender inequality in the labor market and the inadequate economic participation and inadequate political representation are addressed given the foregoing gender positive recovery policies and practices are needed. They're very much needed to increase women's participation in economic development whilst targeted actions are also required to address other impediments to gender equality. Now, in pursuit of the theme of the next 27 summit, which is 
securing our future, the first urgency of now. Today's pre-summit webinar has been designed to convene stakeholders from the public, private, development, and non-governmental sectors so that all of us can critically examine and address policy issues on gender and inclusion across the public and private sectors. There will be deliberations on the mainstreaming of gender equality and inclusion into the organizational framework and also the culture of our beloved country, Nigeria. It is our hope that today's public-private dialogue will help us develop key agreements that will drive advocacy efforts of the gender community of practice of the NESG towards bridging gender gaps in Nigeria for the advancement of economic development aspirations of our dear nation and also for the welfare of her citizens. And therefore, on behalf of the board of the Nigeria Economic Summit Group and our partners, the Federal Minister of Finance, Budget and National Planning, I say a very big thank you to you all for making our time to participate in today's webinar. With the array of panelists that we have, we certainly look forward to a fruitful and progressive deliberation with implementable outcomes. God bless you all and God bless our nation, Nigeria. Thank you very much as I hand you over to Funke Barua. Thank you very much, Mrs. Adetayo. Mr. Adetayo is the board is a board member of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group. We want to thank you for your welcome event. She's also uh, of Kenos Edge uh, Limited. Unfortunately, she would have to leave us shortly, but we thank you for that opportunity to hear from you and provide some context to this uh, webinar. I would also like to say again that the First Lady is regrettably absent. Uh, she called in uh, that she's going to be on the way on an official matter, an urgent one that came up, and she will send a representative who may still join us uh, during this uh, webinar. Uh, I would now go straight to our panel. We have uh, an array of uh, distinguished panelists here in the room. I would start uh, from uh, my sister and a friend for decades, uh, Ms. Hafsa Tadiola Costello. Hafsa is one of three leaders uh, of Connected Women uh, uh, Leaders, and she's the president of Women in Africa Initiative the foremost platform organizing the continent's women into a force for sustainable development. Hafsat is also an economist with degrees from Harvard and Singwa, a pro-democracy activist who lost both parents to her country's democracy struggle. I could read Hafsat's um, bio with my eyes closed, but I'd just like to read it on paper. She's also, she was also a former member of uh, the, of the state cabinet in charge of the MDGs and trade and investment portfolio. She believes women's equal engagement in the economy and governance system at all levels will lead to a better world. Her commitment to harnessing women's power to transform society is reflected in her work, and this spans from the local to the global. In Nigeria, Hafsat founded KIND, a social, a civil society organization that has trained thousands of women in service-oriented leadership. She's one of 50 councillors of the World Future Council, a special envoy to Africa for women political leaders, a member of the BMW Foundation's Responsible Leaders Group, Vital Voices 100, and alum, an alumna of the World Economic Forum's Community of Young Global Leaders. She is also the recipient of several global and national awards, including in 2019, the US Civil Rights Museum Public Service Award. You're welcome, Hafsa Tadiola Costello. Thank you, Funke. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Hafsa. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank Our you. second panelist is also a namesake. I call her FA. Uh, Mrs. Funke Amobi was declared the 2019 All Africa Employee Engagement Professional of the Year uh, by the N2 Group Growth Africa, headquartered in Johannesburg, South Africa. In 2020, she was named one of Africa's thought leaders in HR by High Performance Africa. She's a globally recognized human resource professional a multiple award winner recognized among the 100 most influential HR persons globally by Times Ascent India. FA was also named amongst Nigeria's top 50 corporate women uh, 
recognized for bringing distinct value to the workplace by leading Ladies Africa. She's a global finalist of the Professional Achievement Award. She was a global finalist of the Professional Achievement Award in the 2015 UK Alumni Education Awards. And she was also awarded the 2015 HR Leader Award in Nigeria by the HR People Magazine. As part of our social responsibility commitment, she serves as chairperson of the TREM Career Academy, a non-for-profit uh, enterprise focused on tackling unemployment by raising the employability bar for the Nigerian youth. She also sits on the advisory board of Women in Successful Careers, VISCA. VISCA is a non-profit for women empowerment organization, as well as the board of the Women in HR, a non-profit career advancement platform for women in the HR platform. She's a published author, and her book, Marital Harmony, is currently empowering marriages with extensive reviews and testimonials. Mrs. Oluwafunke Amobi is a chartered CCIPD MCIPM country head for human capital at Standard IBTC Holding PLC. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you very much, Funke. Thank you. Our third panelist is Ibijoke Faburudi. Uh, Ibijoke is the co founder of Elect Her. Uh, she's a development professional and social innovator with cross cutting experience across policy, gender, and government affairs, strategic communications, international trade and investment advisory, development project management, and nonprofit management. She's the co founder of Elect Her. Elect Her is a women's political advancement organization where she drives the vision to bridge the inequality gap in African democracy by advocating for and enabling women's leadership across elective office through behavioral change communications, community building, capacity development, and increased access to social, human, financial, and technological capital. Among other notable achievements, the organization recently launched a $10 million fund to empower 1,000 women and directly fund 35 women in the 2023 Nigerian general elections. Awesome. She's a leading, she's a global leadership council member of the Democracy and Culture Foundation, a 2019 One Young World Dutch MFA scholar and a 2019 public service nominee for the Future Awards Africa. Welcome to the Jokia Fabric. Thank you so much, Funke. Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Uh, our next panelist is a man amongst women. Testimony Asiago is the Chief Executive Officer at Big T Infotech Solutions Limited. He's an edtech, uh, Big T is an edtech organization registered in Nigeria and committed to helping students and educators harness the power of the latest in advancement in IT to solve critical issues in society and prepare them for the future of work. According to the 2019 World Bank report on digital development in Africa, by 2030, 230 million jobs will require digital skills in sub-Saharan Africa. Since 2018, Testimony has led a team in teaching students robotics, coding, and STEM education in schools across Delta State in Nigeria to help them become relevant in the future of work through the Robotics for Kids Africa STEM initiative. In addition to ensure that more kids are reached, especially in undeserved communities, he engages teachers in free train the trainers workshops quarterly and connecting them to local and international air tech shows. He strongly believes quality education at the grassroots is the foundation that stimulates socioeconomic growth. He's a multi award winner, he's a digital skills advocate, STEM ambassador, and is committed to building the next generation of African leaders. Testimony as ever, you're welcome and thank you for joining us as a panelist. All right, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Last but not the least is Chinwe Agwim. Chinwe is a chief economist at Coronation Merchant Bank. Uh, she's a professional economist that has 500 plus published economic notes geared towards macro development and financial economics. She's currently the chief economist at Coronation Merchant Bank, like I stated earlier. She was appointed a national consultant by the UN Economic Commission for Africa to lead the services trade project, which is partly driven by the UN Conference on Trade and Development. Her contributions have also supported high level committees set up by global development agencies. She's been included to the, in the IMF Article 4 consultations, 
African Development Bank annual meeting and as a member of the Board Committee on Research at, at the NESG. In 2021, she became the resident economist for the research-based initiative AIR. AIR is Africa Investment Roundtable. She's a highly sought after thought leader and has spoken at as well as delivered keynotes on several reputable platforms and expert panels. Her TEDx talk on equipping the female economy has contributed to conversations around lifting women. Chinwei is an advocate for women empowerment. In 2020, she was appointed, appointed as an executive council member of WIMBY. Chinwei Egwin, thank you very much for joining us and welcome. Thank you for having me. Hello, Chinwei, thank you for joining us. Say hello to us. <laughs> Thanks for having me, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. So um, as you can all see, we have uh, an array of panelists who we believe would bring uh, the very much needed uh, recommendations, key outcomes uh, that we need this discussion to, to generate. Uh, we know that women in the economy are definitely critical to the existence of our country. Uh, Mrs. Bono Adetayo read out a number of figures around the global analysis of the impact of COVID-19 on the gender gaps in economic participation. And that this has uh, more or less even worsened given uh, the COVID situation. And according to the World Economic Forum's uh, Global Gender Gap Report, we know that another generation of women will have to wait for gender parity. It means that it won't be my generation or the current generation, we, we have it to be the generations after us who would have the responsibility or who would enjoy the closing uh, global gender gap, uh, which will continue to increase from 19, 19, 99.5 years to 135 years. The evidence we have right now suggests that we have a health emergency and the related economic downturn has also impacted women more severely uh, than men. And we know also that COVID-19 has enhanced a lot of businesses, automation, digitalization. So it's not all, all, always been a tale of woe, but we need concrete strategies. We need concrete ideas to engender uh, gender equality and inclusion strategies for economic development going forward. I'd like to go straight to uh, my panelists and start with um, Chinwe again. I'm starting with Chinwe because you are a chief economist and we're talking about inclusion strategies for economic development. So I'd like for you to set the stage, so to speak, and tell us what is the economic case for gender parity? Are we just talking, uh, a lot of people when they hear gender, I'm looking at the number of people on this panel uh, and the number of people in the, in, in, uh, as participants. And sometimes you get the impression that once you just talk about gender, people switch off, people tune off, and they think these women are here again. Uh, but studies have shown that a lot of underdeveloped, underdeveloped countries, particularly in the third world, uh, where, he, where we are right now, because we're not taking the issues of women's economic participation seriously. So as an economist, what is the economic case for gender parity? Over to you, Chief. Okay, thank you so much. Could you just let me know how much time I have so I know how much I can give? Anyway, you have five minutes for this first question. Oh, five, okay, thank you so much. Okay, so now, now, if both women and men are well equipped and economically empowered, sustainable and inclusive growth would be attainable, especially for a country like Nigeria that has um, each gender representing half of its population, right? Now, gains have been recorded in the journey towards this gender inclusiveness, um, but the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significantly negative impact on women. Um, the impact of this pandemic has not been gender neutral, as it has had different effects on men and women. Um, the pandemic has heightened existing inequalities. Women who were already in precarious labor positions with relatively lower earnings when we compare them to their male counterparts um, have become even more vulnerable. Now, projections from a reputable research um, publication shows that Africa could add at least 10 percentage points to its GDP within, uh, I think it's a six year period if each African country um, makes advances towards gender parity. Now for Nigeria to secure economic dividend that comes from empowering its women, it needs to do more. 
empowering women across all economic segments, as opposed to just those at the top, calls for systematic and intentional action by governments, businesses, and community leaders. The following areas stand out for me that I'll share. One would be strategic investment in human capital using gender lenses. So educating female children by funding and creating an enabling environment in Sub-Saharan Africa, for every 100 boys enrolled at the lower secondary level, there are fewer than 90 girls, and that number declines to less than 85 as we climb to the upper secondary uh, school level. Intentionally improving women's skills for employment, especially given the future of work, enhancing women's financial, digital, and legal literacy is also important. Uh, making accessible, appropriate, and affordable healthcare systems available is equally important with regards to investing in this um, human capital using gender lenses. Another point worth highlighting is shaping attitudes. We all have a role to play with regards to shaping attitudes. The onus is not just uh, on the government, but for all of us. So greater effort is needed to change the deep-rooted social views about women's women's role in society and work, because these views trigger many manifestations of gender inequality. Even if um, women are unable to do paid work, they will continue to undertake the larger share of unpaid care work at home if societal attitudes do not change. Um, the same is true for violence against women. Uh, without a change in attitude, it will remain an issue, not just in Nigeria, but across Africa. Um, although campaigns and platforms that raise awareness and advocacy are very important to change societal attitudes, these efforts need to be supported through effective monitoring and um, evaluation. So I'm gonna stop here and hand it back to the moderator. Thank you very much, Shinwe. Those are really valid, valid points. You talked about investing in human capital with a gender lens. You talked about strategic investments and being intentional, not just rhetoric, not just mentioning the word gender to tick uh, all those boxes. And you talked about in, empowering women. I would like to go with that flow and call on uh, F.A. Uh, Ms. Funke Amobi, who is the country head for human capital, Sandic IBTC Holdings, PLC, and to say you are also a private sector person and, and coming from that angle you have vast experience in the banking industry particularly in HR where you have claimed many awards like you, you read out in your bio and you've also witnessed many practices in that space you've had experiences through the years uh, so in recent times uh, we have seen women shattering the glass ceiling. You know, we have seen women cracking the glass ceiling, especially in the banking sector. You know, at the last time we had over five uh, female MDs or chairs of banks. What do you think then has been the greatest challenge that women have faced in the private sector and what has now changed? Thank you very much. And indeed, I'm glad that you started with the good news. The good news really in the private sector is that the gap is closing. And I say that with every sense of pride. A recent publication by the IFR, IFC, pardon me, and the Nigerian Exchange Limited, informs that the private sector is closing the gap in corporate Nigeria in gender equality. And it's been a journey, and I'll tell you how we got here. Specifically, it says the average percentage of women at the executive level is 20%, which is higher than the global average of 17%. It says again, furthermore, the average percentage of women at the global board level is 25%, and in Nigeria is 23%, which is close to that global average. And as you have rightly observed, recently we had eight women CEO appointments in the Nigerian banking industry in one year. Now, starting with the good news is always imperative when talking about topical, globally topical issues like gender equality. Let me give you the not too good news. Whilst, you know, the companies assessed in this report, you know, were a lot more better than the global average on women participation as leaders on boards. And, you know, we had favorably better global, better results than global averages. What still needs to be done? 
still definitely in the private sector, in the corporate Nigeria, on gender balance. Certainly work needs to be done. Now the pandemic has had a lopsided effect clearly on women's economic contribution. That is clear before the pandemic, World Economic Forum actually said to us it will take about 100 years to close globally the gender pay gap. Now with COVID-19, you can tell that there's even going to be a longer wait. So clearly, improving gender equality in formal employment across capital availability for women and all of that across supply chains and all of that is a deliberate effort that private sector has to undertake. There's been a lot of improvement. And if you ask me, how did we get here? How did we get to a point where we have eight chief executives appointment, female chief executives appointment in the financial sector in one year? I would say it's because there's been a lot of embracing diversity and inclusion strategies at a very deliberate level. What has happened is that you've had most organizations in one form or the other, you know, at least pay attention to diversity and inclusion. Many have been moved away from being absolutely unaware and non challenged by the subject of diversity and inclusion to the level of compliance. We've had a lot of regulators, a number of regulators, including the Central Bank of Nigeria, you know, put in place deliberate policies and tracking key performance indicators around the subject of diversity and inclusion, gender diversity and inclusion in the Nigerian banking industry. So what has that done? That has done for many organizations, pay a, helped many, atten, uh, many organizations to pay attention to addressing diversity and inclusion strategically through a number of initiatives. They provide their data and many have moved to a strategic level. But in my view, where we need to be is that point of integration where diversity and inclusion is leadership responsibility. And the leadership takes that responsibility in an integrated manner, ensuring that policies, procedures that are clearly trackable with key performance indicators are done deliberately embracing diversity and inclusion. We've had a whole lot of, you know, I, I don't want to call it a movement, but there's been critical shifts in the direction of what I would call A-D-E-A-R. How do women advance? How do we pay attention to attraction when we're attracting our talent in the workplace? How do we pay attention to diversity and inclusion? When we are developing, how do we pay attention to diversity and inclusion? When we are tracking how engaged our employees are and the drivers of employee engagement. How do we pay attention to diversity and inclusion when we are planning advancement, succession management into our key positions? How do we pay attention to diversity and inclusion management? And very, very important in the workplace today, we talk about the future of work, the rapid advancement in technology and the rise of artificial intelligence, robotics, machine learning, and all of that, the digital transformation and disruption in the workplace today compels us to pay more attention to promoting digital intelligence across the gender landscape. So if you ask the question, female, I, I call them future-ready female, the percentage of future-ready female in corporate Nigeria, who's tracking that? And what, what impact will this have on the numbers of gender equality in the near future? Seeing that the future of work is upon us inevitably, and we will have to rise up to this. So are we then going to be talking about in the next 10, 20 years, the same numbers of women in executive landscape and CEO positions where digital will be the word in the world? The question is, are we paying attention? How deliberate would, are we today? And how deliberate should corporate Nigeria be to tracking the development of future fit with females so that this gap indeed can be sustainably closed. I take pride in the fact that the deliberate diversity and inclusion strategies that have been embraced by Nigerian corporate, Nigeria private sector has yielded some results. So the gap is closing, but there's still a long way to go and we have to be future of work compliant in the manner in which we close this gap. Thank you. Thank you very much, Effie. I really want to take uh the next uh, panelist, uh, but I want to jump to uh, testimony, particularly because you flagged a very critical issue. You talked about a future fit women, you talked about uh, promoting digital intelligence and testimony is the guru in, in, in that life. So I don't want to lose that trajectory. I'll come to you now testimony and ask, you know, recently we celebrated this International Day of the Girl Child with the, with the theme, 
uh, digital generation, our uh, generation. Uh, Although that uh, technology is here to stay and the future is technology, but I'll change it to the future is women. Uh, uh -huh. So if we must learn from the past, we then must anticipate the future. With your work on infotech, uh, in, in the infotech sector, what do you see as the greatest barrier to STEM? I know we've been doing a lot of work to promote um, STEM, and I also worked in another life on girls in ICT when I was with the Ministry of Communication Technology. So I know it's not a new thing, but are we doing enough? What do you see as the greatest barrier here? And what do you think would be the most impactful solution to the problem? And please take it from where, you know, uh, FA talked about promoting digital intelligence and the future, the, the future fit girls and the future fit women. Thank you, Tessie. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, I hope that it's not um, okay, so it's a very interesting discussion here because um, um, I think uh, just recently on a spike level, so it's a digital challenge, and um, we all know this digital generation, our generation. Um, Testimony, I can barely hear you. I don't know if it's your audio. You want can to can barely hear me, right? Yes. Do you want to switch to another? Um, okay. Yeah, better now. Please go ahead. Thank you. Can you hear me now? It's much better Hello? now, please. Okay, all right, thank you very much. Okay, so I, I was saying that recently we celebrated um, the Girl Child Day and um, the theme was Digital Generation, Our Generation. And to me, that, that seems to be enough pointer to the fact that digital skills are taking uh, the, the larger part of uh, attention globally and bringing it down home here in Nigeria. I think, um, well, certainly we are on the right course, but I, I still feel we're not doing enough. Um, we're not doing enough because um, being an educational consultant uh, with over 10 years experience now, um, it's, it's, it's a bit pathetic when you, you find out that our curriculum, our, our ideologies for, because we are focused on building the next generation of leaders on how to build sustainable um, uh, uh, gender equality. Because a lot of times when you talk about gender equality, you, you, we think we want to educate the women. We think we want to make them aware about um, how um, their rights and how to be, uh, inclus inclusivity in everything um, that has to do with uh, um, the society. But, but a lot of times we, we, we forget that this, this is a social cultural norm which we need to start uh, um, solving through education, through access to free quality education from the grassroots, right from the primary school. Because um, once you become an adult, there's a little you can do in changing your perspective, particularly if you grew up from a particular community or an environment. So, um, and that's, that's what I would um, always advocate. So the barrier actually with um, 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 speaking about uh, 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 gender equality across all board is that right from the school and the educational system we have in Nigeria, we're not doing enough. We're not doing enough really um, because at that age, we should learn certain ideologies, certain concepts, certain morals that would help us moving forward. And I'm not, I'm not being gender specific now uh, because um, if, a, if, if, a, if the boy child is aware of how he or she should treat the girl child, then I think that, that, that reduces the challenges the girl child will face in having to demand for certain things. So a, a lot of times, a lot of times we make that confusion, we make that uh, uh, mistake in thinking that oh, the only way to curb this is to provide more opportunities to, to have a level playing field for the girl child. But we need to also inform um, across board right from um, the early years of education because it all comes down to knowledge. It all comes down to information. It all comes down to what exactly you believe are the norms and ideals of your typical society. So if we're looking at corporate Nigeria, we need to start annexing um, our education from the grassroots, from the, from the very primary education down onto the secondary education. So we need to start doing things right from that point. So 
digital inclusion is just uh, is just almost the same thing with almost every other kind of inclusion in the workplace um other 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 kind of uh, advocacies uh, uh, for 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 women so because today in stem a lot of persons still think and it, it, it's quite sad though that stem is only for the male folks but i mean thank god for what has happened um recently i think mrs Funke talked about ceos who are largely women uh, uh from in the corporate uh, environment in the banking sector and i think that's that we also need that kind of uh in uh, uh that kind of improvement in the tech sector where you understand that as a girl you could go places i mean i mean you, we have a lot of uh, examples for that already across the globe but i think in nigeria it's high time we started emb started embracing that so uh, for me i think two things critically let's start from the from from uh, uh, changing the mindsets from the primary schools up until the secondary schools let's 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 give them an equal opportunity let them learn the right things the right social cultural values and once that is done i mean as a girl child while growing up you you're able to stand for what is right because you are aware you know exactly what you, is expected from you so you don't need to sometimes you really don't need to fight for certain things because you do know your rights so i think we need to put that in perspective and then that way we can create a balance moving forward thank you very much testimony i would still come back to you on that especially on uh, what do you what we're not doing enough and other things that we that we need to do uh, i would like to go to uh, ibijoke and take it from where uh, fa had mentioned eight ceos and that the gender gap is closing in the banking sector uh, Ibijoke works uh, on uh, women in political leadership. So I want to see how that is uh, panning out in the uh, women's political leadership. As one of the founders and the executive director of Electra, a, a group of young by, run by young feminists I'm very proud of. Um, I'm one of your fans, by the way, so I'll probably get an autograph later. Uh, Electra is an organization pushing for women's political leadership. And, and you've progressed from identifying the challenges of women in the political space to then actually offer, you know, offering uh, solutions and interventions that target women rather than just you know, agonizing, you are now organizing. So, but what do you believe is the most critical action that would further gender inclusion and bridge the gender gap in the political space in Nigeria? How did the banking sector do it from having no woman? I mean, I grew up not knowing about any woman as MD until the few, you know, like I, Cecilia Ibu, uh, one of those who broke the jinx. And now we have eight, you know, and we don't even have a hundred banks like we used to. We don't even have that many banks right now, which is really good. I don't know what that percentage is. I'll come back to FA to let me know what that percentage is and how many banks we have. So please, what do you think, what do you think is the next critical action that would further gender inclusion and then help bridge the gap in the political space in Nigeria. Ibi Joken. Thank you so much um, and, and good afternoon again, everyone. Um, good morning, actually. Um, so I think let me take the questions in twofold. Um, first, you, you asked me to compare the trajectory in the private sector and the growth the experience so far. Um, you know, with the evolution of the female CEOs across the banking sector and how we will compare that to what's happening in politics. Unfortunately, that doesn't translate, you know, at the moment, I think we have less than just about 4% um, in Nigeria's parliament. And that's such a shame, given that's where a lot of, you know, our policies are turned into, into laws and, you know, what really drives, you know, the policy agenda of the economy and the country, um, you know, in general. So there's obviously a huge gap. But then I think one of the fundamental mistakes we make is to separate private sector from politics or from the public sector. You know, um, I think they're all aligned as an intersection in the sense that this evolution we're now experiencing in the private sector is a very welcome, you know, um, development and something that could translate into politics as well. Um, I remember as a child, you know, as, as you as you rightfully said, um, Funke, that you didn't see a lot of female CEOs or female leaders, and that in itself has a mental 
it has a mental implication on you or how you see yourself, your confidence, you know, as a woman or what you should or what you should not be in society as well. But now that we're seeing more women rise up to the challenge and take on the boardroom, take on the seated, seated positions, now we believe that we can do it. And so I think that's going to cut across as well. But when you look at some of the develop, developed economies as well and how women's organizations or women's movements have evolved, you know, you can see an alignment with the evolution of the private sector as well. Um, one of the things I say is the boys club have suffered at the boys for so long. I remember last election, I was in a room where a couple of guys raised about 500 million naira for a guy. And in my mind, I kept thinking, we are the women, we are the guys, you know. Yes, women have suffered um, financial exclusion. Women are still catching up. But I think, you know, we need to build our own ecosystem as well. The politics of Godfatherism of politics is so prevalent. And while we're trying to fix the system, I think it's so important to understand the existing situation. So we cannot change the system if we cannot, if we don't prefer solutions to the existing problems, right? So it's wishful thinking where we're saying, oh, one 50-50, and we can't really bring solutions that are now. So for elector, for example, we're thinking about 2023. What can we do? You know, to really move the needle and to really get women elected in 2023. Um, I need to give credit to the women's organizations that have been doing a lot of amazing work over the past 25 years. It is not an easy field to play, but I would say the time is now. There's so much coming together. First of all, is um, so before I go to some of the solutions, um, uh, Madam Fouquet sent something. She said the central bank have put in place deliberate policies and are tracking the KPIs. This is what we need to do in politics as well. Unfortunately, that's still received in a very in a very red way in, in, in politics. When you look at the you know temporary special measures that are being introduced right now in the in the in the, in the political space. So you're talking about bills such as the additional seats, which essentially is just to is to tackle you know, that urgency, that urgency um, in terms of the low representation of women across boards. So Honorable in, um, in, in Kirika Onijiocha, for example, has proposed the bill to create additional seats so that women across the parliament, across the state and federal parliament, you know, can be given reserved seat. However, that's been received, you know, publicly with mixed reactions, but it's the first reading um, is the first gender-centric um, bill actually that's passed the second reading so far. And that really says, you know, that really gives um, a perception, um, a perspective into how a, a, a parliament run by men actually receive um, issues or solutions that tackle gender inequality as well. Another one is the Gender and Equal Opportunity Bill, which I must commend Senator Lujimi for. This bill has passed through different assemblies, various assemblies, and for one reason or the other, it's been declined or rejected. And I think for me, that is so sad. And we need to come to a place in Nigeria where we understand that gender equality is not just about women. It's about the nation. It's about equity. It's a, it's about equal representation. It's about ensuring gender inclus um, inclusivity and diversity as well. It's about ensuring that half of the population are reflected in the way we're governed, in decision making, in policy making as well, because that's where we can have a holistic and a functional um, society. So when you talk about, you know, what are the critical things we need to do? First of all is, I think we need to address the barriers. Yes, we know those barriers, but I'll just amplify a couple of them. First of all is the social and religious, the social, religious, and cultural stereotype. These are so prevalent, you know. And yes, the financial barriers, but I'll tell you something, even if we tackle the financial barriers right now, even if we put the, legisl the, the, the legislation in place right now, without the right mindset or re orientation, the voting population might still vote based on social, religious, or cultural sentiments. So as stakeholders from the private sector, from the public sector, from the third sector, there has to be an intersection where we have um, a coherence and communication that people need to understand the role of women in society, but people need to understand the role of equity and inclusion in society as well. So when we're talking about, you know, gender equal um, equality and inclusion strategies for economic development, I think the message when it comes to breaking out the barriers of social and religious stereotypes is, look, 
there is no economic development without without the inclusion of every every strata of society and i think that is one single line of communication that we all need to drive um also um violence violence has to be tackled series of elections i mean Nash natasha koti you know the violence and also she had to pay even after she was brutalized that's the kind of justice system that we have. And unfortunately, it's so unfair, right? Um, we have a PDP woman's leader. A house was burnt down with her in one of the states. And what, what I mean, what's what's the justice system saying today? So women face a, a, a wide range of, of violence that's economical, that's um technological, actually, um, that's also financial, that's psychological, that's just oh, oh and I think we need to start tackling it. The more we break down those levels of violence, not even not just um not just um you know taking violence as this very vague, vague um what you call it, vague um, word, it's important to understand the different ranges that violence actually manifests in the political space and then start tackling them. Another thing is um obviously is the um having men as allies. I keep saying it, unfortunately. Right now, um, we have less than uh, we have less than five percent representation of women across parliament in Nigeria, which means the parliament at the meantime is represented and is led by men. And as such, to really move the needle and get women into parliament, we need men as allies. We need men who are progressive and, and forward thinking and positive thinking and see how we can get them to actually drive some of those things. To be very realistic, sometimes, you know, um, when women, when, when we women are talking about gender equality, it's just the, you know, women have come again. But when you have a man, you know, also support you, also show that, look, this is so important, we buy into that exactly helps as well. And that's one of the things that, uh, can you hear me? Well, I had a glitch. Okay, great. And that's one of the things that we've actually seen, you know, in the private sector where we've had a couple of, you know, men now advocate for women's um, incl um, inclusivity in the private sector as well. Um, one of the key things that I think is also very fundamental is private sector engagement. The level of apathy, you know, is, 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 is quite a shame to be very honest. We cannot talk about um, gender equality. We cannot talk about economic progression, right? And, 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 and want to be apolitical as a private sector. When you look at the United States of America, organizations like the Emily's List, Vote Runly, She Should Run, are partnering with private sector. And Emily's List for an organization which is the largest resource um, helping to advance women into pro-choice women into politics, have raised over $600 million to get women. You know, this is one of the organizations that we actually understudied as the lecture because we're like, look, we cannot go on this way. After speaking with women in the field, saying what are the critical barriers you're facing? So there's a social, the social political um, barriers, which definitely that has to be a very um, coercive um, um, way to tackle it, bringing all the sectors together, all the players together. But as a financial one as well. So definitely everyone has to come together to tackle the, the lack of technological infrastructure, financial infrastructure, social and human capital. And essentially, more than ever, we need private sector engagement and collaboration as well. Yes. Thank you very much, if you're okay. I could, we could go on and on. You know, I also used to be a player in that field when I was CEO of the Nigeria Women's Trust Fund. Uh, so we'll come back to that conversation. But I just want to move to a global and international uh, space and someone who has worked in that area and she knows who she is. So I'm calling Hafsa Tabiola Costello. Thank you, uh, Ibiju. Okay. Um, Hafsa, your experience, of course, spans from local to global. I like saying that word. You know, I want to be like you when I grow up. And you've recorded impressive achievements at all levels. Uh, a lot of things Ibijoke mentioned about what's happening here in Nigeria, uh, the social, the religious, the cultural stereotypes, having men as allies, and you know, bringing in the private sector, the example of the Emily's List, which is one of the, you know, the reasons or the, uh, one of the uh, models you know, that the Nigerian Women Trust Fund co copied uh, to start that fund as a fund for, uh, for investing in the political aspirations of women. So through your lens as an African who, you know, has had the opportunity to work at all these uh, levels and from a, you know, a data-driven perspective, what would be your recommendation of best practices, policies, or strategies for gender parity? Bearing in mind that uh, even though some of these are international best practices, 
we can adopt them, we can domesticate them, and some of them can work in our environment. Over to you, Hassan. Thank you, Funke. It's been such a pleasure listening to the outstanding speakers in this um, panel. It's an important conversation. I think that um, the most important thing I, I think it's important for me to say is that we should first analyze and understand the scope of the challenge that we're facing. And then we can put together the right solutions. I think, yes, we can learn from the rest of the world, but we also have to know that in some areas, our situation is unique. So what am I saying? I'm saying that actually we should consider that Nigeria's economy and the economies across Africa are in a way apartheid economies. I know that's such a controversial um, definition, um, description, but I think it is accurate. You know, we have people like Mrs. Funke Amobi and really exceptional people in corporate Nigeria, but what is the size of corporate Nigeria? Maybe in terms of wealth, it can be dominant, but actually in terms of where the people are employed in Nigeria and not just in Nigeria, but across Africa, it's the informal economy that is dominant. Some data will give us figures as high as 85%. That's actually the rough um, estimate that the ILO gives for the size of the informal economy in terms of um, employment of people in Nigeria. And you know, people will start talking about the poor governance of Nigeria and that's why, but then countries that are considered better governed, I read um, the article by the finance minister of Ghana in the Financial Times, where he um, um, puts their informal economy in Ghana at 90%, even worse than Nigeria, right? And, they, and they're every, this is a country that everyone is always trying to present as if Nigeria is supposed to learn from them. But in this area, we're doing better. I think that it's actually not unique to these two countries. It's, it's continent-wide. What we are running are essentially like colonial economies, um, what we call the private sector. Uh, these are the things that were left behind when um, our friends left in 1960. And luckily we're having this conversation in October, just as our dear country marked its independence. We haven't really moved very far from being a colonial economy. Now, if we can run, the question is, can we suppose that we can run a democracy, which is about people power in, an, in a world, in a space in which the people are not empowered. I mean, that's, that's the contradiction. I was listening to the lady from Elector. I mean, that's the fundamental contradiction is that, so all the energy for how she, if, if you want to try to do the Emily's list, all the energy for that is going to be directed at what, 10, 15% of the population. That's not how Emily's list is structured in the US. I think that we need to, we need to, the, the big challenge we have in Nigeria, in every African country. I was just speaking at, um, um, at Ambition Africa event in Paris, where I asked the lady from one of the major um, organizations there, um, it's, I think it's part of Hermes, but they do analysis, financial analysis. So I asked her, what is your unemployment rate in France? And you know, they, they're still reeling from COVID. Their unemployment rate, Funke, is 8%. When the Nigerian Bureau of Statistics gives, gives us Nigeria's unemployment rate, it's around 25%. And then when you count underemployment, it's another 25%. I don't know why we always are just fooling ourselves and talking as if we know what we're talking I mean, I just don't understand what planet we're on. Um, given the figures that we have and the scenario, the global nature of the challenge, economic challenge that we have as a country, and not just as a country, as a continent, I want to emphasize this because when Nigerians start talking, they start talking about the challenge in Nigeria, the governance challenge. No, there is a problem with our relationship with our external partners. It has to be renegotiated at that level. It's not just the leadership in Nigeria. And I want the Nigerian people to start focusing on this issue. There's also the problem of the tax um, remittances and the illicit financial flows, which is depleting the country of much needed resources for which we could use to build infrastructure. Testimony was talking about the 
is plans for um, IT. For that, we need the right IT backbone. We need all of that. That costs billions. The roads, the rail, this which this administration has done more than any of the previous administrations that we've had since 1999 on investment in infrastructure. I don't know where the 16 billion that are uh, those, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> sometimes I get so, you know, I'm so rarely negative. I mean, I know now that I sound quite negative, but I'm so rarely negative about people that if for someone that I'm negative about, I should just not say anything. But let me just say that I think that this is the challenge that we have as a country is that we're trying to build something and we don't have any of the tools with which to build it. So, so in terms of solutions, so that when it doesn't look like I've just come to complain, the first thing is that, you know, this um, IFC working with the Nigeria Exchange, I've just launched Nigeria to Equal, which is to look at how we have gender equality in leadership, in employment, which is important, but not so important because, as I've said, the employment, when you look at formal employment, it's not even 15%, right? So let's just set that aside. But they're also looking at gender equality in entrepreneurship, and this is fundamental. We need to provide pathways to prosperity for people in the informal economy as of like now, as a, as a matter of urgency. It's nice to see that um, the presidency talks about this. You know, they have this plan, this COVID plan. And when um, um, the vice president came on to the Women in Africa webinar, he talked about how they're targeting women in a lot of their um, spending public procurement. This has to be um, escalated or de-escalated to all states. All the states of Nigeria spend huge amounts of money um, but that's that's not just Nigeria. All states, period, in, in the U, um, in Europe where I'm currently in, um, public procurement is about sixty percent of the economy. So states spend huge amounts. Let's make sure that half of what they're spending is going to women entrepreneurs. They can put in laws for that. And women in the informal economy, maybe in the informal economy, in the terms that they're not registered with the CCAC but they are registered actually at local government level. They're registered at state government level within cooperatives. So you can work with them at that level. So they have to be getting this money because when they get the money, you don't have to tell them to run for office. They'll put their money together and run. They'll put their money together and find the person that they want to represent them. Then also at the private sector level, 1% of global multinationals, 1% of this global supply chain is going to women entrepreneurs. This is a global figure. I'm sure that for Africa it's even something like 0.5%. So there's a lot of room. We need all, and that's actually something that that um, project by for Nigeria to equal is supposed to work on. So essentially, let me close because I know you don't have a lot of time from care. But the truth is we need to move beyond words and we need to move beyond um, trying to fit into the Western discourse, we're not Western. We're actually feeding the West. We're structured to feed the West. That's why our countries were created. And that's why the flow of wealth, which actually is a, um, has been studied by the Soros Foundation is from the, um, the countries of the global South, including African countries to the West. So within our own framework of exploited nations, where we have 1.2 billion people in Africa, 200, over 200 million in Nigeria, and growing every day. We need to come up with practical solutions that focus on where the people are, where the people are poor, where the people need um, capacity built, where the people need support. Right now, we are focusing too much attention in the minority, which is the private sector, which is the organized private sector, and they can't carry the whole country. It's too small. So we have to democratize the economy. We have to democratize skills and we have to democratize enterprise. And we can then begin to talk about having democracy in Nigeria. Thank you. That's what you get for trying to take notes when you're a moderator. So I was trying to take notes, that's why there's a gap. Thank you very much, Pastor. I've learned a lot today. You talked about the, never heard this before. You said we're an apartheid economy, and I'll go straight to my sister Chingwe because she's from corporate Nigeria and she's an economist. I want her to take it from where has that stopped. Has is saying our economy is simply not doing good enough or well enough for the kind of 
uh, dreams and aspirations we have. We have some infrastructure, it's not enough. There's a huge gap, you know, uh, we have, you know, a huge percentage of our economy is informal, which is uncaptured in any way. Uh, compared to France, which just has 8% unemployment rate. I don't even want to talk about what our employment rate is because sometimes you don't even have the figures. It's banded here and there. You hear this from the NBS, you hear this from the national planning and budget. So, Chinwei, what are your thoughts about gender inclusiveness in corporate Nigeria? You know, and the major, I know you've mentioned a little bit about, so in just two minutes, please tell us uh, what the practical steps or impactful steps are to move this needle forward, considering all that my sister has said, has said regarding uh, the, the size of our economy and the fact that there's just simply not enough in terms of space and in terms of resources. What are your thoughts around gender inclusion? We have done well so far. The private sector, I think, is even doing better than the political and governance sector. But what are the, what, what, two, maybe you just give us like two um, impactful steps that we can take to move uh, the middle of development forward on gender equality in Nigeria. Thank you, Chinwa. Okay, thanks for that. I'll try my best to stay within two minutes. Um, so Thank with you. regards to corporate Nigeria, let me let me focus on my sector, which is uh, banking and finance. Yes, policies have been put in place to improve um, female representation at the top of the ladder across banks, but there's still room for improvement. Um, now, narrowing the gender gap in leadership across banks would foster, you know, stability in the banking system and enhance economic growth and possible reasons for these conclusions are, one, women may be better at risk management, um, biased hiring practices may imply that the few women who do make it to the top are better qualified or more experienced than their male counterparts. Um, more women on boards translates to diverse views, which leads to better financial decisions. And of course, institutions that select women to top positions are most likely uh, better managed. But it's very important to note that the number of women in the banking industry tends to dwindle as one climbs that professional ladder. Uh, so you would find that the junior management at the junior management level, female representation is quite heavy but it thins out as you, you know, tilt your head up or you progress towards middle management and then senior management. Um, now in my capacity as an ESCO member of uh, the Professional Women Bankers, that's an arm of the Chartered Institute of Bankers in Nigeria, I have led quite a number of surveys and they point towards the fact that programs and policies aimed at achieving gender balance within the industry remain relevant. Um, a large proportion of respondents express that bank could encourage female employees to pursue relevant advanced qualifications necessary for moving up to middle management and top management positions in the banking industry. And this could be done through the provision of grants or paid study leaves. Um, it's equally important that banks integrate gender diversity into succession planning frameworks um, by identifying a talent pool within the bank and ensuring that there is a diverse pipeline of executives um, being prepared for board positions as they become vacant. Um, lastly, it is highly recommended that female banking executives become more visible as leaders and uh, mentors within the industry, therefore serving as role models for younger female and uh, you know, prospective bankers. So yes, we've seen um, laudable steps, good progress, but like if you you know dig deeper, you'd see that there's still um, room to close the gender gap within this industry. I picked banking and um, finance because I believe that's where we've seen the largest progress. If I look into manufacturing or um, FMCGs, um, you'd see that the gap is still significantly wide in those um, sectors. So I think that's two minutes. Thank <laughs> That's two minutes. Thank you. I'll go to F. Day, Mrs. Funkia Mobi. Uh, she's also uh, in the banking sector, and you know, of course, IBTC is, is more diverse than, than just the bank. And I, as a as a human rights thought leader, you know, what are your? Can you give us one or two best practices, policies, strategies, or action that you think every organization should take to foster gender equality and inclusion? Chinwe has talked about visibility for for female 
uh, uh, banking heads in the private sector and also in the private sector as role models and as mentors and for more visibility for them, you know. Uh, she also talked about uh, improving on policies to close the gender gap and some bias hiring practices to ensure that more women come in, which also have, which of course she said happens, but at the lower level and as they go up the, the pyramid, these things are. Uh, so uh, FA, what, what are your thoughts as an HR leader? Are you in, a group, in agreement with these bias hiring uh, practices? Do you think women have enough visibility? Uh, what do you think about mentorship? Or if it's different from this, what are your thoughts on the, the one or two best practices that we need to do going forward? Thank you. Thanks very much, Funke. And I absolutely agree with Chinwe's comments in entirety. You wanted to know the numbers, so let me give you the numbers. There are eight female bankers, and I'm looking at 30 banks when I remove the microfinance banks, NDIC and CBN, that would give you 26.6% by good, by every measure of benchmark, that is a very healthy figure. Now, additionally to what Chingwe has said, I would like to start with, and I'm gonna give you just three. I'd like to start with, we need to be deliberate in the corporate sector beyond financial services. We need to be deliberate about diversity and inclusion being a practical subject matter that is accountability, that whose accountability is tracked up to board level. So we need to move away from being integrated in our practice of diversity and inclusion to being destructive about diversity and inclusion strategies. We need to appoint a diversity and inclusion officer who is accountable to the board and is certainly tracked by metrics on whether or not we're making progress. This moves us away from the point of ideology to being practical and sustaining progress we've made so far in all sectors. Secondly, and in fact, more importantly, we need to be future led in our diversity and inclusion strategies. We need to be future-led because I am sitting as, a, as an HR professional in a state of concern where I see the, the gains of today being potentially eroded as we transit into the future rather astronomically because with the advancement in technology and disruption, digital disruption across industries, not just financial, financial sector, across industries, you will find regardless of what we do, that digital skills, digital literacy would be in, in increasing demand for industry to operate. So if we lose the women in this conversation, we will erode the gains that we are celebrating today. So I'm particularly committed to the point of destructive diversity and inclusion agendas. We need to be innovative and think around the box. How are we going to get these women future ready? When we profile the talent required digital, because it's war for digital talent that is on. When we profile the war for digital talent, how do we see the diversity footprints? Where do we see the gender equality coming up? We will see it tapering down. And I say that, you know, once upon a time, I used to be an advocate of the future of work is here, the future of work is here. I was such, you know, tagged a future of work prophet. Then it came to pass, COVID-19 accelerated the landing. In my view, first landed the future of work. Now I'm the prophet of future fit females need to be integrated into the digital transformation agenda, else we will lose this trajectory. Testimony said it. You need the girl child to begin to think STEM. You need the female young talent graduating from uni to begin to think technology careers. You need the female to begin to see there's something for me in tech. And I'm passionate about this because believe me, we are not looking strongly in this area. We're saying so much about digital, we're saying so much about digital transformation, and it's happening across industry. COVID-19 has made it go beyond banking, financial services into every industry is get is up in the game on their digital agenda and indeed their digital business plan. Now, where is the gender conversation in providing digital talent? I'm passionate about this, and I think this is this is a bulb where we have to shift. We have to shift to have sustainable shifts. We really have to hit on this nail. Finally, I'm in the space of leveraging women mentoring women. 
I think we have to be more deliberate about this space. At the end of the day, I'm a woman. At the end of the day, you are a woman. If we have how many CEOs who have taken up the financial services space recently, I'd like to see them get very, very busy mentoring the next level of women. I'd like to I'd like them to take on the responsibility of not exiting that space without the next level rising into that space. Women mentoring women gives a magic outcome. So we have to be very deliberate about this in corporate Nigeria, across industry to be sure that women are deliberate about it. There are a number of mentoring, women mentoring women organizations already, you know, in corporate Nigeria. And I mean, in the Nigerian, corporate and business landscape already. We could leverage them. We could be creative and, you know, create ours. In many organizations, in my organizations, as Tambika have to say, we have a blue women network, a network of women where we deliberately pay attention to pulling women up the pipeline, ensuring that you provide that support when it truly matters. One of the speakers mentioned when it truly matters, I think it was Chinwe, when we, it truly matters in the pipe, when the female is falling out of that ladder saying, no, I can't do this anymore. I just got married. I've just got children. I can't do this anymore. I can't face this pressure anymore. Another, we've got to have an infrastructure, deliberate institutional infrastructure in place to support that decision-making process that the woman, the female and professional is undertaking. Thank you very much. Funke, you're on mute. Oh dear, forgive me, I've been speaking to myself. I was just saying that uh, FA and testimony are attacking because they are on this digital space and women in big tech and you know getting the digital generation our generation active. Testimony, I'm coming back to you in two minutes, please. I want us to take questions from our audience and we have some questions already uh, in the chat room. What do you think would be the greatest enabler to your work in this space? Uh, Mrs. Amobi spoke a lot about you know the three things you'd like to see mentorship deliberate efforts and some future-led, uh, uh, future-fit women. And she's been emphasizing that. So for me, those are the three takeaways from her point. But what, what do you think would be the greatest enabler of getting more women in the tech? In this gender equality and inclusion strategies for economic development, it's, it's come through all that we're saying. A technology is it, information technology, uh, whatever, you know, ICT is it, and this is the way to go because the future is now no longer uh, the formal workspace. Even the informal sector is leading, uh, in, you know, this uh, IT technology. What, what, what do you think? All right, thank you, Funke. Um, I think first things first. Before we we got into the twenty first century, um, education has always been education, and um, the only difference now is that. Um, we are trying to tilt towards um, digital learning. Um, and I think I would also still say that the COVID-19 simply fast tracked what should have um, started happening 20 years from now. So we, we're starting to see some harsh realities and some of the countries, uh, some of the third world countries uh, were able to, well, to a large extent, um, navigate through the crisis. Um, Nancy Mandela used to say, uh, education is the most powerful tool you can use to change the world. So this is just about anything um, in every sector. With the right education, and um, while everyone was speaking, uh, it's all crossed to my mind. Uh, I'm sure a lot of, uh, from, from what you had read, the bios and profiles, a lot of presidents had some very fantastic education. And that's largely, that largely played a huge role uh, as to what they are doing today and why they got to where they are. Uh, but can we say the same thing for um, a lot of communities in Africa today? Can, can, can we say they've been supported um, uh, educationally to get free quality access to, uh, access to free quality education? I, I, I beg to differ. So I, I think that's where, because um, now largely, preferring solutions now, I, I think um, it's high time the government started looking into supporting um, organizations that are driving change through education at the grassroots. Because when you have your citizens educated, then a lot of sol uh, uh, solutions will be preferred uh, by these citizens. And 
invariably, some of the challenges the country socioeconomically would be facing would naturally be solved. Um, I think uh, it was uh, one of the speakers mentioned uh, uh, about uh, uh, discrimination for the gender folks. But you would, you would, you would want to agree with me that um, countries where you have predominantly um, whites have tend to face less of gender um, violence, largely because of the kind of environment and the society they uh, they live in. So a lot of um, countries where you have um, blacks predominantly, um, you have a lot of um, folks who, uh, for one reason or the other, are not um, didn't have equal access growing up to the same level of education. I think that's communities where you find some of these challenges. So moving forward, um, one of the solutions I would provide is because largely some of the work we've some of the works we've been doing uh, we've been getting supports from international partners, uh, 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 organizations like uh, uh, the USAID and all that. But we really get support from the government itself because perhaps they, they're not looking into that direction just yet. And I, I also would want to talk to uh, address the issue of um, curriculum development. We need to start looking in, inward into the content that these kids and these young future leaders are taking in because it's what it's it's the content it's it's what they what they learn that they that they they, they tend to amplify moving uh, on in life so when you talk about digital skills and digital learning as far as i'm concerned it's still learning but in a different mode and in a different pattern so um, it's it's important. Okay, my time is up. So it's important that as much as possible, the government supports organizations that are driven, uh, uh, that are driving change through education. Because only when we drive change through education, that is when we begin to see true results and sustainable results. Thank you. Thank you, testimony. So education, digital learning, that's good. But. Uh, you gave me a point that is going to take me to Ibijoke. We're running a bit out of uh, time, so we'll just take the next five minutes to take uh, one question uh, to, to, for Ibijoke and Hafsa to take one question. To, about something testimony mentioned, you talked about discrimination and discriminatory laws. So Ibijoke, do you think we have any such laws in Nigeria? What, is the, what do you think is the major discriminatory law, uh, gender law that might uh, in, impact women's capacity or the opportunities women have to participate in economic development in Nigeria. And if there is none, uh, you know, uh, what do you then think would be most impactful if we did incorporate you? I know you've mentioned the gender and equal opportunities bill, which have also been part of pushing and it's still sitting there, it's not yet passed. Uh, thank you so much, um, Funke. So, um, I mean, at the moment, the country is going through the review of the constitution, which in itself, you know, is a very problematic piece of document, given that it's what is, you know, governing the entire nation. And it is not a gender friendly or gender sensitive piece of legislation. And I think, you know, different groups have actually flagged different um, clauses that actually empower the development of female of, of, of women. But also there have been bills like, so it's one thing to have bills that are counterproductive, it's another thing to have bills that, you know, are a bit progressive in nature. So the, the Violence Against um, um, Persons um, Act, for example, um, at the moment, a couple of Northern states are still yet to domesticate it. And, you know, when, when testimony is talking about um, digital literacy, the girl-child education, just education in general, um, a child that is deprived the right to leave or the right to live or the right to have a choice or a decision cannot even dream you know of having a basic education talk less of you know um, um um getting into the wave of you know the digital economy as well so you know that is one thing that i think that every state should actually domesticate because that then helps you know children, especially in the most impoverished um, states in the nation or areas in the nation to actually have a right to at least have some form of education that would shape the orientation, the attitude towards living, and also help to um, um, give them access to education as well. 
The constitutional review that is going on at the moment is so critical to how we move as a nation um, in terms of, you know, women's rights, in terms of the theme of the constitution as well, because it's very male-centric. It has to reflect, you know, the rights of women and men as well. And to be honest, it's the, it's, 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 it's the piece of legislation that actually, you know, drives all the legislation as well. So regardless of what we have for the Child's Right Act, for the electoral bill, for any other bill that we're pushing, the constitution still has to be revised in such a way that, you know, it's um, it's very friendly to every citizen of society, men, women, children, and um, boys as well. Thank you very much, Dijon. Okay, I'll go quickly to Hassan. Hassan, um, I'll come back to this question. I know you, you told us that we're, we shouldn't compare, uh, we're different. Uh, I cannot still uh, developing. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, but given the diverse uh, uh, and, and culture we have in Nigeria and you know our economy and where we are, the fact that we, we really are still struggling. That's the truth. Africa is struggling. <laughs> We are struggling. We have a lot of potential, but we're still struggling. Mm -hmm. And 60 years is not enough. We're comparing ourselves to economies uh, that have a 2200 year lead start, even to some of us. Not an excuse, but a critical factor was also uh, uh, a seat. What would you advise, you know, then for uh, gender inclusion, for instance, at subnational and local level? Which I can mention, or, or was it that I read somewhere about? you know, rural or women or local women. We always talk about that. But what would you, what would you suggest? What would you advise for gender inclusion at subnational level? Because at the, at the top level, you know, there might be more strategies that we can see, but is this really trickling, uh, trickling down? No, it's not. It's not because it's not really meant to. I mean, how much of our money gets taken out of the country? You know, so I think that, I think, I would look at three solutions at the subnational level. And actually a lot of this we've documented, there was a group that the government set up called the Technical Working Group on um, Women that was led by um, Mrs. Felicia Onibon of the 100 Women Group and um, Mrs. Amina Oyagola of um, WISCA. And I was um, put in charge of the women and the economy. And so we have a lot of recommendations that the government has that we've put in that. And, but I'll just even, I think that you see, I remember the time Funke, um, of our own um, pre-colonial system and the way that our people used to engage with the monarchies. And if you looked at the structure of the palace, the palace was situated at least in Southwest Nigeria, which is where I'm from, in the middle, surrounded by people because the people wanted to be able to engage and in a sense hold accountable their leadership and I think that that's what we lost with the colonial encounter and the post-colonial state is it didn't really provide that relationship between people and accountability of those that govern them we're still trying to build that and I think that because we're still trying to build that um, and we're and as you say we're so young the combination makes for a lot of challenges of governance um, I would say the one of the most important things that we can be doing at the local level, which we can use technology to help us do, is to follow the money. You know, the part of the challenge is that our money isn't being used to its optimal effectiveness. Public money and even the private money, a lot of it is going out through illicit financial flows. So um, there's something that we need to do. How can we capture money? Because development costs money. How can we capture money to finance the development? Um, Mrs. Amobi says we need to be future fit. We need the girls to be future fit. That costs money to build capacity. She's in human um, resource development. She knows that better than anyone, how much it costs for Stambic IBTC to have um, global standard staff. It costs money, but the money is not really available. So how can we at least capture some money to be able to better finance. I saw that we, there was a bill that was passed that was going to increase the money that we pay teachers. That is critical. I was, I was educated in public system in Nigeria. I only went into private system when I went into the US. And my, my performance was gangster, not just in, in the US, but also in China, prepared from Nigeria. So our public systems were very strong then. We can rebuild. 
I, I think we tried to expand um, the public system, the intake, but we didn't spend enough time also expanding the, um, the teacher training, the teacher pay. You know, why are teachers owed salaries and their salaries are already so low? You know, these are things that I think as middle class and um, elite Nigerians, we need to fight for these things. If we don't want the Boko Haram, we need to fight for these children. We need to fight for the quality of their education. We need to fight for the quality of the resources that goes to educating them. And then we have to couple the economy. I, you know, right now with COVID-19, the global economy is kind of decoupled between, you know, also, also, I don't know if you noticed that China is experiencing electricity problems. You know, this is so impressive for China to be experiencing that because they even have backup supply in every state in China. When President Yaradua came to Beijing while I was in Beijing, I said to him, talk to the Chinese government and let them partner with us in just this one area. Because they have backup electricity supply in their states. But even with all that, they're experiencing challenges with electricity, which we experience every day. Now, I know that we have this Siemens deal. Let's all follow that Siemens deal. I, I was so happy to see that um, um, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie asked the chancellor, the German chancellor about this. We should all follow it. We should follow the Nigerian side, we should follow the German side. They must deliver that power supply because Nigerians are power. I've not been in any country in the world where I've seen the power that I see in Nigerian people. Nigerian people are outstanding, but they cannot make out of nothing. They need that power to be there so that they can be globally competitive. Then the last thing is that we must democratize expertise. We must use you no know, testimony, all that IT, there's even a group called ITU at the global level based out of Switzerland, and they have funds for this and they partner with NCC. Let's work with them and provide a technology backbone to all rural communities and reach our people with the skills. Let's be training our women farmers using, um, you know where the Coke is always selling in every village. Let's turn those things into um, a digital learning center. Let's be aggressive about Nigeria, because let me be honest and let me close with this, Funke. I've gone all over the world. I travel all the time and I go to many African countries. The confidence that Nigerians feel as black people, I don't see it everywhere. I don't see it everywhere. In fact, I don't see it anywhere outside of Nigeria. We, when the, U, the EU gave us the European partnership agreement that we didn't agree with, we vetoed the Ghanaians I don't even want to mention the country. I just delete what I just said. Let's just say that other countries accepted this deal, even, the, even though they knew it wasn't a good deal for them. What Nigeria should have done is push for a good deal. That we didn't do. We just said, oh, it's not a good deal and we vetoed. That's not enough. You have to then fight for a good deal. And that's why we need the public sector to do more. But I have to tell you that our public sector, when I compare in, in the defense of our interests, to other countries in Africa, I think they're not doing so very badly. They can do better and we can push them to do better. But when you when they defend Nigeria's interests, and I, when I whenever I go if anywhere, I see that they're doing that. That's what they're supposed to do. What we then need, and, I, and I'll close with this, I need us to stop fighting each other. So ethnic groups fight each other, religious groups fight each other, then people fight the government. There's no fighting. In fact, there's too much fighting. Let's start learning how we work together, how we coordinate, because the resources aren't enough. But when we're fighting, we waste more resources. So then that way we can actually improve the effective effectiveness of resources. We then we can troubleshoot together. There are targets that we need to meet, but while we're fighting, we will we'll, we'll, we'll become blind to the targets. We need to stop. And that's why we need women, because women don't fight. Women are practical. We just want to make sure that there's food for the children, that there's something for the future. So we need more female energy, enough of the male ego. It has to be me. It doesn't have to be any of us. It has to be 200 million Nigerian people. And we must put that agenda in place. We must coordinate together, work with the government, work with the private sector, work with the informal sector. And all of us, then all of us together can move that country. Thank you very much. I agree with you. We need to be aggressive about Nigeria. We need more women. Enough of the negative energies, wherever it's coming from, half such. I would not say it's just from the men. So thank you. I would like to open up the floor for uh, our, our participants uh, in the room. I have three questions already here. Uh, thank you, Oluchi Uchegu. Thank you so, 
first, let me thank our panelists. I'm going to come to you with more questions from the floor, but thank you so much for all your points so far. But I want to spend the rest of uh, the time at least engaging more uh, with the audience. Oluchi Uchebu has asked a critical question, which is going to go to uh, my sister, Ibi Joke. Uh, he's asking, Anambra election is on November 6. Uh, there is no female representation out of the 18 governorship candidates. How do we en ensure inclusion for women in digital and political space? Um, if it's okay, if you can just take that in two minutes, uh, that would be, I know you've, you've mentioned a lot of steps, but just at least to address. Uh, Sorry, can I, can, can I have a last part of the question? How do we, uh, how, do we how do we ensure inclusion for women in digital and political space based on the fact that the current Anambra election due next month on the 6th has no female representation out of the... Thank you very much, Oluchi. Um, yes, I mean, that is really sad. Um, and obviously we all look forward to a time in the country where we actually have, um, you know, female um, gubernatorial candidates. Um, we did have a couple of them. And one of the prominent ones was, um, she's a current senator, like, her name's just skip me now. But we also know that a couple of barriers, you know, um, she had the money. So even when we're talking about money, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a function of the political and um, the party, um, internal party democracy and politics, and also um, just general social and cultural stereotypes, because you actually had women's group from Manabra State actually say that, you know, it was not a time to elect women. And I think this was just very counterproductive as well. But in terms of how do we start getting women elected? How do we get women into public offices and into, into, into elective government positions? I would say, you know, um, it is just behavioral change communications, ensuring that we can break down the social cultural stereotype. Because amongst everything, the biggest form of poverty for me that I see is mindset poverty. And there's a lot of reorientation that needs to happen. Um, but also, um, aside that is every stakeholder needs to also partner as well from media, from private sector, to, um, to development partners, to the political parties also need to have a good buy-in as well. There has to be the implementation of temporary special measures because for every country in Africa that has achieved or seen an increase in, um, you know, in the number of elected female um, officials, they have in implemented some form of gender quota, either voluntary um, gender quota at a party level or reserved or legislated gender quota. But we need to get up that conversation in Nigeria where we're saying gender quotas are discriminatory to actually understanding that there are temporary special measures that are meant to tackle an urgent um, decree, um, increase in um, the, the level of women that are elected across the country. Yeah, two minutes. I think your, your, what I can get from your response to Oluchi is that we need quotas. Uh, and it's always, uh, I always say that quotas are, uh, they may not be a seat at the table, they're at least a foot in the door, then they sit at the table. And then if you don't have any seat, you can bring your own seat and put it at that table. So quotas help and they even the level, the, the level playing field. I think that's what should happen. Then for the, for the Anambra elections, like you said, it's really sad. Uh, I don't know if there are even deputy roles for, for women in this election, but yeah. Thank you very much for that. Oreva has a question. Oreva Taya says, she's asking, is there any information about platforms uh, that already exist for women electorate? And Oreva, I think that uh, uh, Ibijoke would also answer that question. But if I may, uh, we have Elect Her, for instance, and she would read out others as the Nigerian Women's Trust Fund. Uh, there's young women, in, there's, a, there's women in politics forum. If you okay, if I've missed, missed any, please, please. Uh, no, there are tons of them. Um, people actually, I mean, there's, um, there's Yaga Africa, um, on the policy bill, there's Plaque. Um, there are tons and tons of organizations, actually. But um, or ever, I'm happy to, produce, to provide you an extensive list if you'll um, reach out to me. Yeah. Thank you. So please, uh, Reva, please uh, send a private message to, to be okay. The second part of our question is asking, how can we channel the concern, resources, and energy of young women into a voting block across the country to move things from advocacy to results? I would actually like Hafsat uh, to take a stab at that question, and then it'd be okay, you can also come. Hafsat, so what was sorry, the question again? Sorry for putting you on the spot. The no, question, no, no problem. How can we channel the concern, resources, and energy of young women 
into a voting block across the country to move things from advocacy to results? I think that the key is organizing. You said um, going beyond agonizing to organizing. We need to do that. And it's a very difficult thing for us to do because we are kind of agonizers. We like agonizing, we talk, we describe, and we lament. It's a cultural, it's become part of the culture. But if we want to change society, we need to do better organizing. I mean, we saw this I because of the June 12 movement that my family was involved in. I saw we you need to. We need to organize women in the universities. We need to organize them, um, the young um, girls in high schools, into clubs. And it could have the same name. It's probably better, even if it doesn't have the same name, it could, the program can have the same name. And we're all committed to Nigeria to equal. We can, we can even borrow the name that IFC has used, but that's, um, that's for them, it's for women in the economy, but this is for women in politics. And, mm -hmm. and actually, we shouldn't even, as I, as I try to explain in my remarks, we should not limit our agenda to women in politics. My mom was an entrepreneur. She financed the oil workers strike in 1994. Without being an entrepreneur, she could not have done that because MK was already in prison. So we need women to have economic power. And when, as women have more economic power, you, you, even without anything else, the dynamic of power will shift because a lot of what drives power is money. Mm -hmm. So, so, we, so I think that club should be, or that program, Nigeria to Equal, should be, uh, it should have an economic, political, mm -hmm. and social dimension. And we need to be working all together with every, every year, we, maybe uh, March 8th, there's something we do. And we can use all the tools that we've learned from all the efforts that we've had, which includes training, mentoring, coaching, sponsoring, you know, and then also aggregating resources. And we need to also set an agenda for changing culture. What do I mean by this? Let's change how we spend money as women, less mm -hmm. on our appearances, you know, more on our agenda, our interests. Let's, how, women already pool funds in the ASUSU and all of that. Let's also start normalizing pooling funds for our political agenda or economic agenda. So let's get started um, at the rural and city, peri-urban, but across the country, across the country, because the problem is common nationwide. And then let's ask the women that are the most successful of us, women like Mrs. Amobi and other incredible women in the NESG to also be like, patrons, like helping provide backing. Um, it, we will need only for a while because as we get started, it should be self-financing and we can think of ways to do that. But if we set this agenda, actually within 15 years, we will have, we will have equality. It was a, a, when a, the, this idea that I'm telling you was given to me by this woman that um, Dol Dolores Uharte, who is, um, from Mexico, but she fought for the informal workers in the US, in the United States. And she gave me this idea in 1999 when I was coming back to Nigeria. And I just thought to myself, this would take too long. Funke, what year are we in? Had we started then, we would be so gangster now. Mm -hmm. So I think if we start now, we can, because there's no, there's no shortcut to, you know, in the end, if, if, um, if Electa is successful within the current framework that we have in Nigeria, it will be a minority of women, elite women, that we will have in these key positions. And they'll push an elite agenda if, if, they, if unless they're deeply conscious. And then we will have the kind of problems where we have the um, Pandora papers telling us about the woman that took money and from that was supposed to be used to build um, the airport in Enugu. And you know that's not what we want and that's not what Nigeria needs. So if we really want to radicalize and really change the system, we have to change how we play it. Thank you, Hassan. Uh, and thank you for bringing the rural women's perspective. I don't know if anyone know, knew about uh, uh, Mama Bisi of, uh, of the Kowan Women Fame. And that woman mobilized uh, hundreds of thousands of market women across Nigeria with 100 Naira only. And I remember some of her resources and help helped also in the structuring and formation of the Nigeria Women's Trust Fund. Ibijaki, I don't know if you have a minute to just chip into this last part of the question on how can we channel the concern, resources, and energy of young women into a voting block? Uh, and then I take the next question. 
Thank you. Please keep the questions coming in. At least we yes. Have Thank you very much, um, Brinke. So, I mean, um, one thing I say is um, last, I mean, the last year has been a very good expose for the world in terms of, you know, just seeing how women, um, our women across the globe actually pushed for, um, you know, um, gender centric measures and also progressive measures to tackle the, the, the pandemic, but also the NSAS campaign as well. Regardless of the outcome, I think there was a huge lesson from that. And that is that when Nigerians come together, you know, yeah. you can get resources, you can get action. And I think that was very powerful for the first time. And for me is those things, are, it's very close to home. When I look at some of my friends that have this level of apathy, they are young around me, they don't care about politics. They just want to make money, have a good life. But when answers happen, they actually understood why all those issues and they stand tie us together and why they cannot dissociate from them. So I think for me is, um, one of the things is let's just continue speaking to ourselves. Let, we all need to advocate. Let's organize at whatever level, even if it's at the, you know, at our level that we understand or at the rural level, within the context of our reality, let's just keep, you know, opening the doors and ensuring that for each door we open, we can open the door for other women as well. Um, within the context of our reality, if we actually shape things, then we can open more doors for women at the rural areas across board as well. You know, that's one thing I firmly believe in. But as well as ANSYS campaign taught us what crowdfunded, the power of crowdfunded, you understand? Crowdfunding from people in the diaspora and across, but just people who cared about the nation, the infrastructure that drove the campaign was from a, young, a lot of young people who were so dissociated from social issues. Sorry, I can't hear you. Actually, young That's women, the infrastructure yeah. that backed the campaign, the people that left the campaign, the face of the campaign were women. And that was very powerful. And that is our reality. That's the story to tell. And we'll continue to ride on that. You know, that's very important. Those are critical lessons that we then need to like take and ride on um, with as well. So in terms of that is that energy, that old pent up anger, let's turn into action. Digital revolution is making inform the information space, you know, so accessible. With that, let us ensure we are putting factual news, let us ensure we're communicating with ourselves. Let's ensure that we're extending knowledge and ideas. We are also mobilizing resources as well. Critical resources is so important. Either social, technological, financial, um, human capital resources as well. But with the digital revolution, at least at our level, we can then mobilize for, you know, um, for women right. and that leads to yeah, um, good ideas. Thank you. As well. I'm so sorry to pass you over. No, it's really okay. I know time is not. Uh, yeah. My third question is Can we have a private sector national coalition of women as an active institutional machinery? I think we have in, a lot of that. We, have, we actually even have WIMBs right now, but I'll leave the expert, uh, um, FA, and um, my sister. Um, Chinwe to answer that. Efe, do you want to take a stab at that? He say, can we have a private sector national coalition? This is from Joseph Atta of women as an active institutional machinery for gender balancing in Nigeria. There is now need for a gender balancing and inclusion strategy. This should be a blueprint with actionable and trackable milestones driven and monitored with respect to practical actions to address factors that have brought exclusion in the first place. So do you want to give examples of the gender uh, institutional machinery for gender balancing in Nigeria. Thank you, Funke, and um, thank you for that question from the from the writer. Now, the truth is, hearing it makes me even sad that the question is coming up. It says to me that we're, we're not we're not out there enough, or the you know, so the right people don't know about what they need to know about. So there are institutional. You got there already. Um, um, from care, there are institutional provisions already in corporate Nigeria. There's WISCA, Women in Successful Careers, and Women in Successful Careers has been around for over 10 years, about 12 years now. And the focus really is on supporting three, three, uh, three stages in the career life. I sit on the board of WISCA at three stages, entry level, mid-career, and advanced level, breaking the glass ceiling. And, you know, it's advocacy also for policy at the corporate level and at the government level as well for gender um, equality and all of that. Now there's women, there's WIMBIS, women in business and, and um, women in business and government that's been around for I believe 20 years now. And WIMBIS also is strong on advocacy 
Wimbiz is strong on women. It's got the Wimboard program, women in boards. It's got the it's got another program for mentoring, I believe. So there's strong advocacy in that on that platform as well. There's professional women round table. There's IWOW. There, I mean, IWOW is um, women women on another platform. But there's a number of women organizations institutionalized platforms already, and they're all navigating change in measurable terms. I know that some of the shifts that we have in corporate Nigeria today was indeed spearheaded by some of these organizations. So women that should take advantage of this provision, this institutionalized framework, are encouraged to do so. And we should also spread the news because the truth is, if we don't know that they are there, then it means that it's not even doing as much as it could be doing to enable us achieve this overall agenda of improving gender balance and inequality. Because the truth is the subject matter is only going to be dealt with little drops from here and there, because it's not, it's, it's not a one it's not a one size fits all agenda. It's multiple stakeholders coming together with the same intent, purpose, objective, but with, in a, with a point of difference. So government is coming together with private sector, public sector, the non-governmental organizations as well. So everyone's got to do their piece of this massive agenda. So my, my take is every single woman should know what is available and take advantage of what is available to play our own individual parts. It's very easy to say, you know, private sector do this, government do that, everyone do that. What am I going to do, woman? I have certainly got to do something. And part of what I need to do is to be mindful, to be knowledgeable about what's available out there and take advantage of it at the appropriate time to indeed improve my own, you know, uh, my own opportunities, take care of the threats that, I, that I'm that i faced with because we will all be faced with these threats. But, you know, in your career and in your business as a woman, how you respond to managing these threats would really, really be a function of, as you know, what you open yourself, what you avail yourself, the opportunity to take advantage of. So it's important that we know of these organizations and we take good advantage of them at the appropriate time in our career Thank cycle, you. business cycles. Thank, Thank you. Very much. Thank you very okay. much. Can I add something quickly? Yes, please. Um, yeah, yeah. She, she, she did cover quite a lot. But yeah, I was just going to speak to WIMBIS. That is Women in Management, Business and Public Service. And yes, we're 20 years this year. And there are quite a number of initiatives that um, we do conduct. Sorry, my video is switched off. Sorry, let me put my video back here. So yeah, so there's WIM board, and um, that speaks to board representation, better board representation. There's WIM poll, so that's in the pol political space. And then even winning without compromise, that's looking at um, girls in university level. And of course, there's a big sister program. Um, but I find when I have conversations with people who are um, well postured to join these organizations that they're not as curious as they should be. Um, some are a bit judgmental. Um, so I think um, the onus would be for those who are well positioned the rural economy, but those who are in the rural economy and to do their research, that, that's, that's your responsibility and um, be more, more curious um, because I am a product of um, some of these platforms that were mentioned. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to seriously thank all our panelists. I wish I had time to help, let you do a, a closing statement, at least for one minute, but we're seriously out of time, we have just three minutes to the end. I see that, that there are other questions uh, from Gloria Ibrahim, from Dr. Fuluke Dada, uh, Ayotola Jagun, and the uh, Olushola Kayode. Uh, and I see also that our panelists have been responding to the questions. Please, uh, I cannot take these questions because of time, but I can see that uh, Hafsat and, and the other panelists have also started responding. Uh, please, Chinwe, uh, Mrs. Amobi, Ibijoke, and testimony. If you go to the question and answer part, you'd see that some of the participants have asked some questions. If you can please just respond to that. Thank you very much to all our panelists. I wish I could also have time to summarize, but I guess uh, while asking questions, I've also summarized a lot. But the most uh, critical part is uh, uh, visibility for women, uh, mentorship, uh, 
They asked us to check out the Nigeria to Equal platform. Please, let's do that. We need to keep advancing, attracting, and developing these talents in women. We need diversity and inclusion strategies. Uh, we need deliberate and intentional policies on diversity and inclusion. We also need to invest in women capital, you know, with a gender lens and not just rhetoric. That's the only way we can close uh, this gap. We're doing well in the private sector, but not that well. We're just seeing it at the at the top and in a few scattered uh, uh, spots, you know, like in the banking sector, like have said. But we need to really begin to set an agenda for changing the culture and the social narratives. Have said, be aggressive about Nigeria. Be very intentional and aggressive. Thank you, testimony. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Funke Amobi. Thank you, Hasta Tabiola Costello, Chinwe, Green, Mr. Joke, Papo Rede, and Testimony. And so I'm going to hand it over to Mrs. Ogechi Obiora. I'm so sorry, Ogechi. I've taken four minutes of your time. I don't know how you're going to close this in less than one minute. And thank you to all our participants for staying the course. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so very much, Funke, and um, to all our panelists. And I want to say on behalf of the Nigerian Economic Summit Group and the Gender Community of Practice of the NESG, um, I just want to express my profound gratitude to you, our participants, uh, you know, for accepting our invitation, for staying with us, for your active participation. Thank you. And I want to thank most graciously our efficient, very efficient moderator, um, and our seasoned panelists for you know coming here to share with us um, and 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 for the insightful and a very wonderful session and for the robust discussions. Thank you all so much. I, on behalf of the NESG, thank you. And then uh, so I would also want to say that this uh, this summit pre summit event is the eighth out of all the, uh, the nine pre summit events for the twenty seven Nigerian Economic Summit. Um, the, ninth, the ninth one will take place just uh, immediately after this meeting. So if you can, please still join us while we'll continue the conversations. And again, I just want to reiterate that the, the, the summit, the Nigerian Economic Summit is jointly organized by the NESG and the Federal Ministry of Finance, Budget and National Planning. And like Hafsat rightly said, uh, we need to start, stop fighting ourselves, including the government and find ways to engage. You know, and that has been the mandate of the NESG for over uh, 27 years. We do not leave the room, we stay, we talk, we push, and we urge you all to join us um, as we continue to fight for a sustainable and inclusive Nigeria. So on that note, um, I would also like to once again invite you to the 27 Nigerian Economic Summit Group, um, Nigerian Economic Summit, we're 11 days away, um, it's happening on the 25th and the 26th of October. And the theme is securing our future, the fierce urgency of now. And I, I can tell you that everything we spoke um, about today reinforces the need to secure our future and that it is actually very urgent. So please, if you have not registered, kindly go to the website, nestgroup.org slash 27. To, pre, to register and get your tickets. And we look forward to continuing this very disruptive discussions and to press for solutions at the summit. And as noted by uh, Mrs. Wona Detayo while delivering the welcome address, the conversation does not end here. You know? So this feeds into the overall summit conversation. Um, and again, at the summit, we have a gender session which is titled Women, Work, and Economic Growth, Closing the Gap. So there in that session, we're really going to, you know, put into, uh, bring up all the discussions, the action points, and everything we've discussed here today. And we're going to drill down to actual action points and the agenda, which is going to drive the work of the community of practice in the coming year. So please get involved. Uh, the summit, the conversation is both for the private and the public sector stakeholders. And like I said, we're going to explore and conceptualize ways that we can reverse the poor economic trends in Nigeria, foster gender equality and inclusion and improve human capital base of the economy mitigate the very serious challenges that are currently plaguing us and lay the necessary foundation that will leapfrog Nigeria 
into a future of high and sustained inclusive, inclusive economic growth. We have done that in the past and we're even more eager to do that going forward. So to conclude, um, if you'd like to be a member of the gender community of practice, I see a lot of our members among the participants. Thank you for your support all through the years. And please kindly indicate, um, we will be sending you a form at the end of this meeting in your email. So please join us uh, while we continue this disruptive work that we want to do in the Nigerian space to foster gender inclusion. So we look forward to receiving you at the next 27th summit on the 25th and the 26th, either physically or virtually. So thank you very much for your time and have a good afternoon. Thank you and uh, so we're we overshot by four minutes and we apologize for that. Thank you so much. We're almost out of time to change our nation. Inflation upsets our welfare. Insecurity threatens our safety. Political apathy impacts our freedom. Digital exclusion limits our potential. We all deserve a secure future. If not now, when? Participate at the 27th Nigerian Economic Summit. Theme, Securing Our Future, The Fierce Urgency of Now. Date, the 25th to the 26th of October, 2021. Register on www.nesgroup.org forward slash 27. Thank <laughs> you.